Hello and welcome to No Cap Game Design. Today, we're starting a new masterpiece series, and as you might have guessed by the title card, I'm playing The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. The purpose of this masterpiece series is the same as always, and that's to study the principles of game design by actively pointing out, explaining, and making sense of what I consider to be masterpiece games. But before we get into the game design analysis, a little bit of background. This game, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, was released in 2006 for the Wii and GameCube. It was originally going to be a GameCube exclusive, but with the release of the Wii, Nintendo wanted to put some massive flagship game on it, and so the game was delayed by a few years, but that time allowed the developers to further refine and polish the gameplay experience. This is a heavily engineered and extremely well polished game, so I hope that I can find a lot of good lessons learned here about game design. And you don't have to just take my word for it, this is the best selling Zelda game of all time, that is, until Breath of the Wild in 2018, Twilight Princess reigned supreme for over 12 years. That's pretty good for video games, especially games in an extremely popular franchise series like the Zelda games. Now, in this playthrough, I'll be playing on the GameCube version of the game, not the Wii version of it. Now, there are some minor differences that I won't get into between the GameCube and the Wii version, but the one difference that I do want to point out here is the Wii version is mirrored horizontally compared to the GameCube version. Everything is exactly the same, except when in the GameCube I take a left, the Wii version of the game will take a right. Now, this seems like kind of a weird, specific change to make. Why would the developers do this? Why would they introduce this horizontal flipping between one version of the game and another? And the specific reason I find is very, very unique. The Wii is a gameplay system that affords physical interaction, which is a really technical way of saying the Wiimote. The player can swing the Wiimote and Link on screen will swing his sword. However, most people are right-handed. Link, the character that the people are playing as, is left-handed. During playtesting, the developers found that right-handed people had a difficult time controlling Link's sword because he was left-handed. So the solution, instead of just making Link right-handed, was make the entire world right-handed. Flip everything around. So that way they can claim that Link is still the same Link as in the GameCube version. It's just a mirrored universe or something like that. And I thought that was a really creative solution to a fundamental design problem. Another notable element of the Twilight Princess game specifically is this game is rated T for teen. It's got darker themes. The word Twilight is in its name, so it kind of makes sense that it's a little more gritty, a little darker. But this makes the game stand out compared to all of the other Legend of Zelda games. Now, granted, Breath of the Wild, another Legend of Zelda game that was released more recently, is rated E10+, everybody 10 and up, which is pretty similar to rated T for teen. However, I don't think it can be denied, Twilight Princess is a darker game. The story features a lot more, let's say, adult plot points, kidnappings, murders, destruction. The art of the game, the assets, the creatures, the characters are a lot more gritty, they're a lot more evil looking, a lot less cartoony. And yes, overall, this is a dark game. Just in the fact that it's dark out, or at least sunset for a lot of the time that the player is playing, in dark areas like woods or caves. Now that normally doesn't affect the ESRP ratings of games, but I thought it was kind of poetic, so I'd include it in here. This is a dark game, physically and emotionally. Now the last element that I want to talk about when introducing this game is I actually have a confession to make. I have not ever completed this game before. I had this game as a kid, and I probably played the first two, maybe three hours of it once. But that's it. So I'll be going into this game kind of blind. Now, I've done a lot of research and I know the plot of the game. I've watched other people play it. But I myself have never beat the game. So I hope you'll bear with me as I slowly learn the controls and work my way through this masterpiece game by myself for the first time. 
The last note that I want to make is not a note about this game, but a note about this Masterpiece series. I don't think I'm really going to explain the plot of this game. Not because the plot isn't worthwhile or worth talking about, but because I don't think I can do a good job of explaining it. There are so many other great YouTube content creators who have already explained not just the plot of this game, but how this game fits into the entire Legend of Zelda timeline. But if you do want to learn more about Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess, and I know you do because you're watching this video, then consider checking out the description or a link in the top right now. I've linked to some other videos that explain the story of Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Well, with all that introduction out of the way, let's get into some actual game design. And because this is a new series, we get to talk about my favorite subject, tutorial design. In this episode, I mostly want to focus on how the developers use the architecture and the mission objectives, the quests, to teach the player how to play the game. This game features one of the best tutorials that I've played in a long time, because it doesn't feel like a tutorial. It feels like I'm just playing the game. So how do the developers do this? How do they make the most boring part of most games fun? First, the architecture. The player starts off in this open space. It's an enclosed safe area for the player to learn how to use the camera and how to control the character on screen. It's important that this room is circular. There's no corners, no hard edges, nothing for the player to get stuck on. And critically, it's very difficult to hide Link. Even if the player tried to get lost, they couldn't. The camera will always have a straight line view towards wherever Link is because the architecture of this area is circular. Good design. The specific lessons here is the number one first thing and most important that you have to teach your player is camera control and character yeah. movement control. This lesson we learned in the first Halo game. I recommend you check that video out. Next, as the player at least demonstrates competency with the camera and movement, the play space grows. The immediate task objective is in the next load zone. So the player explores into the next room, and this room is a little bit more complicated. It's no longer a circular small room where the player can see everything at all times. It's a long, narrow line. Now, hallway rooms like this are not that complicated, but they are a little more complicated than just a simple starting circle area. Here, the player is learning long-term movement, and there is a small fork in the branch about halfway up. The player could turn left, or they can continue going straight. If the player does continue going straight, the area is blocked off. The player can't progress into even the next room past this. Now, this is good design for now. Because this is a tutorial, you want to lock the player into the area that has the solution to the quest. But it's also good that the developers allow the player to make mistakes. It would have been faster if they went straight to the lake right away, but then the player might not realize that there are opportunities to get lost in the later zones. After the player completes this fetch quest and retrieves their horse, they're tasked with returning to the village. And in order to do this, they have to go back the way they came, through the initial start circle room, and into the town. This level layout, where the starting spawn area is kind of in the middle of the tutorial zone, I think is good design. Forcing the player to walk through their starting area anchors that area in their memory and helps them build a localized map of the area. Instead of forcing the player to go further and further and further away from the start area, the developers are forcing the player to explore their immediate surroundings before setting the player free on their expansive adventure. Now, the final architecture point that I want to make here is the town architecture. The player started in a small circle room, then a linear hallway room, and now this large town hub room. It doesn't seem like a lot of progression going from a circle to a line to a town, but this is exactly what makes it good design. It doesn't feel like progression, it feels natural. The developers aren't just simply dumping the player into a large, complicated area and telling them to figure it out on their own. No, the developers are building in the support structure for making the player more and more comfortable with the game slowly and steadily. And the way that the developers are doing this is with the architecture of the rooms that the player finds themselves in. This is really cool, really good design. 
Next, I want to talk about the quests, the mission objectives, or the tasks that the developers are giving the player. These are all words that kind of mean the same thing. They're ways for the developers to motivate the player's play. What is it that the player should actively be doing in the game? So let's go back to the circle starting area room. The developers start the player off with clear and explicit direction. Where's Eponia? And then the camera moves and shows the player that way. Okay, maybe it's not clear and explicit instruction, but it's pretty clear and pretty explicit telling the player, you gotta find your horse and you should start by going that way. Now the quest itself here is important. In order to achieve this objective, the player literally just has to walk around. It's a simple quest, and in order to succeed, the player has to demonstrate control over the camera and movement. Again, this is the number one thing that the developers are trying to teach the player right now. If you expect the player to do anything else, then it's probably too complicated of a tutorial for the first task. Now, as soon as the player finds the horse, they have demonstrated that they are able to control the camera and move Link around, they get a new task. Interact with the environment, pick that flower, and use it to whistle and call Eponia to you. This is the next lesson that the developers want to teach the player, how to interact with the environment. It's a pretty simple lesson, and the solution to this quest is right there. I was standing in the flowers when I was told to do this quest, so it's not too difficult. But it's still a critically important lesson. Clearly the second most important skill that the developers thinks the player needs to have. The environment is interactable. There are things that you can pick up or do in this world, and you can do them by pushing these buttons. As the player enters the town, more and more of these fetch quests or side tasks are slowly introduced, and they reinforce different types of movements, different types of camera technology, more interactable environment objects, different items, different menus. Slowly, each task is introducing something for the player to learn, a new affordance or mechanic that is now available to Link. Now, this is still the tutorial. The player isn't free yet. And these aren't technically side quests. They are required tasks that the player needs to prove mastery over in order for the developers to let them continue playing the rest of the game. What do I mean by this? After the player is finished using the horse in the next day, Link starts by talking with these kids who are in his front lawn. They're talking about the slingshot and how excited they are to try and play with the slingshot. This is the player's main goal. Get the slingshot and then they can progress. So the only other place that the player can explore is in the town. And all of these quests, all of these people are scattered around with hidden prerequisites. In order to get the slingshot, the player can buy it from the store but the store owner is unhappy because her cat has ran away. If the player looks around, they can see the cat is staring at the stream and someone says maybe it's trying to catch a fish. But in order to catch a fish, Link needs the fishing rod and on and on and on, these prerequisites stack up, creating a chain, a net of quests. Any character that the player talks to in the town is either providing him with a new quest starting point or is giving him a hint of how to complete a different task. Eventually, the player explores and solves one of the quests, and the reward for the quest is not gold, or rupees in this game. Often, it's a new affordance, a new tool that's used to solve the next quest. The player can use the hawk to grab the baby basket. You return the baby basket to the mother, who gives you a fishing rod. Now with the fishing rod, you can catch fish. With a fish, the cat goes back to the shop. And now the player can go to the shop and interact with the shop menu and spend some rupees that they found just scattered throughout the game. So I've been calling them quests, but they're not really quests. They're more in the form of tutorials. The developers are saying, demonstrate to me that you know how to use this new mechanic that we're introducing to you. And if you can do that, then we will give you another new mechanic that you now need to demonstrate mastery over. And if you can do that, then you will slowly grow more and more freedom in this game. This is really good design. 
It makes things like learning how to equip items or interacting with the player menu or even just how to use the stuff in the game feel more interactive. It feels like the player isn't just learning, it feels like they're playing. It feels like they're solving problems and making progress. This is a really engaging and compelling tutorial. To generalize and summarize here, the lesson that I'm trying to illustrate is that good tutorials don't feel like a tutorial. They feel like gameplay. Rewarding the player with new mechanics and then testing the player, do they understand how to use that mechanic? That's a really powerful, effective, and most importantly, fun way to teach your game. And to go the extra mile to make it a masterpiece game, the developers have spread some story elements on top of it. Each quest has a single person tied to it. Each character is real in this world and has emotions and personality and is thankful that you have helped them. When in reality, the player is just learning how to play the game. Good design. Now, the last topic that I want to talk about in this video is still about quests, but it's a little bit different. I want to talk about the player's attention what it is that the player is focused on. Continuing to focus on this town example, this open area with a chain of quests, how do you get the player to find the start of that chain? And even if they're in the middle of that chain, how do you get the player to find the solution to that quest? I guess another way to phrase my question is, how specifically do the developers make these quests easy? And I believe the answer is from player attention. The most simple answer to this for making a quest easy is put the solution to the quest nearby. All of these tasks can be achieved by staying in the same load zone as the quest giver. You don't need to go back to your house or go to the pond in order to solve all of these. Everything exists in the town. You don't even have to go into any of the buildings, just explore this one load zone area and you'll eventually find the solution. So keeping the solution next to the quest giver is important. Additionally, the quest giver further helps the player solve the quest. If you talk to them again, they'll sometimes give you a hint. Oh, I lost my baby basket. I put it down right by this river and it must have floated away. Can you help me find it? That's a pretty powerful hint. Follow the course of the river and you'll probably find the basket. Other quests, like the very first quest that the player is given to find the horse, physically moves the camera. In the Halo series, I discussed that the camera is the player's attention. Wherever the camera is looking, by definition, the player is also looking at that thing. In order to make the player pay attention to something, consider moving the camera. And when you're making early game tasks and quests like this, don't be afraid to move the camera very liberally, especially early on. Once the player gets a little more experience, then it can be kind of frustrating if the game constantly and is always giving you the solutions to the tasks. But early on, the focus is on learning how to play the game, not on creating complicated and difficult puzzles for the player. Now, the final trick for drawing the player's attention that I want to highlight is movement, and sometimes color too, but there's not really any examples in this area of color drawing the player's attention. If the player follows the river all the way to the end to try and find the baby basket, they're not going to find the basket. Instead, what they'll see is a monkey jumping up and down at the far end of the river. Why is this monkey making such a hoopla of, of celebration that it stole this baby basket? Well, because it needs to draw the player's attention. It's small, it's off in the distance, and so a player could easily miss it if they don't know what they're looking for. And so the developers rectify this by causing it to move. This is an effective and super important tool that game developers use in order to draw a player's attention. If you want the player to pay attention to something, make it brightly colored or make it move around a little bit. Okay, so that's a summary of player attention. 
The developers are focused on teaching the players new skills, and so they give them quests. But the quests are easy, and they're easy because the developers are constantly drawing the player's attention to the solutions of the quest, which also just so happen to be nearby, making it even easier to draw player attention. But how does the player actually go about achieving the quest goals? Well, all these tasks are a type of quest that I like to describe as mechanics quests, not skill-based quests. In order to solve any of these tasks, the player needs to have the correct tools, the correct affordances, in order to interact with the world in a certain way. For example, in order to rescue the cat, the player needs the fishing rod. There's nothing else that the player can do. No amount of extra health or extra skill or experience will help the player catch the cat. Because the only way to get the cat to return home is with the fishing rod. The player either has the item or they don't. Simple as that. Now, you can make the argument that in order to catch a fish, that is a skill-based thing, but it's not really. This is a really simple, really easy fishing area, and I tried once or twice, I couldn't even fail in catching a fish. So that's another lesson to learn. When you're making early game quests or tutorial quests, do not make them skill-based. Make them mechanic-based. All the developers are doing here is not asking the player to demonstrate mastery of the tool given to them, just basic competency familiarity or awareness that the tool and mechanic even exists in the game. And all of these are one-step quests. As soon as the player demonstrates they understand the new skill or the new affordance given to them, then the quest is over. Now later, there will be compound or multi-step quests, but here, early on, these quests are all extremely simple. And that's good, because the player, quite honestly, isn't ready for more complicated or difficult quests. And I'll leave it there. Almost 20 minutes of analysis and only 10 minutes of gameplay. But what can I say? I think the tutorial is one of the most important parts of any game. It's the first thing that your players experience, so it's got to be well polished or else they'll put the game down. And it's a mark of a masterpiece game if you can make the most boring part of your game, teaching the player what each button does, if you can make that part fun and engaging and gripping, then you have to be a good game designer. So whenever I play a game, I always pay a little bit extra attention to the first 5-10 minutes of the game to really see how the developers design their tutorials. But to summarize this video, the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess has a well-designed tutorial, because it doesn't feel like a tutorial. The developers prioritize camera control and movement, but they steadily increase the game's complexity. That's the tutorial part. But how specifically is it done in this game? Well, first, the developers start with the level architecture, starting with a simple circle room and then increasing the complexity of the hallway and then the hub town room. But then they increase the complexity of the quests, slowly giving the player more and more complicated things to do. A simple fetch quest, then interact with the environment, then explore and do all of these things. There's all these new buttons, new items, environmental effects that are exposed to the player through these quests. And at the end of it all, the player has the skills to be able to explore and move around and interact with the game on their own, but they're still missing one critically important skill to learn. Combat. In the next episode, I continue the discussion about tutorials, and I'll be specifically watching for how exactly the developers add danger and challenge for these new players. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video or are excited to see the rest of the Twilight Princess series, please consider subscribing or liking to this video. You'll train the algorithm, not just to show you more of my videos, but to show you more Legend of Zelda or more game design content generally. And that's one of the best ways to become a better game developer. And it would also mean a lot to me if you did so. Either way, like it or not, I'll see you in the next episode.